and still our hearts and just pay attention to what your word has to teach us as we look at the issues here of Colossians and the issues of not losing our hope, keeping Christ as our head, not getting wrapped up in, in the philosophies and, and human tradition, Lord, but just keeping 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 Christ who is our head and understanding that, that the body is nourished from him, not from any human viewpoint, any human wisdom, but truly and only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We do thank you for that, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay, so let's turn to the book of Colossians. And we'll pick it up in verse uh, 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, uh, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And then he goes on. I was trying to find a, a period there to stop the sentence on, but Paul, the master of the run-on sentence. <laughs> so we're not going to get that far, so we'll just we'll just stop there. Um, but what we, what we are going to see... Um, the study is a little choppy to start because there's a lot of little things we got to take care of. But once we get over to verse 9, we'll, we'll probably take, start taking it in, in bigger chunks than we have been. Um, but we have been working through this. We saw last time the issue of the faith, uh, love, and hope in verses 4 and 5 there. And while the, the focus of the book is, is on keeping Christ as, as their head, the, the issue that he's trying to bring forth also, or as well, um, is when you don't do do that, one of the things that happens is, is you lose your hope. And we'll see that you, if, if you don't stay grounded in good doctrine, you also lose your hope. And and we don't want that to happen. We've seen, because just in a nutshell, you've heard me say before, if, if you lose your hope, then you lose the purpose for the body of Christ, then you lose the purpose for the cross, and you, might, you better go live like you're at Israel. You know, like we saw on Sunday, the verse that says, you know, if in this life... We have hope in Christ only. We are the men most miserable. And the reason for that is not, well, we could have been out partying. The reason is, well, if we put our hope in Christ and that's not right, then we should be doing the law. That's why we're most miserable. That yeah, because well, otherwise, you know, we should be out there doing the law, doing the deeds of the law. That's why we would be, would be more most miserable, right? Okay. Um, so in, in verse 5 then, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Now, again, this is Paul's prayer for these people. And it, it's interesting how he puts it here, the word of the truth of the gospel. And what he's telling you there is you really need to rightly divide the word of truth to understand what Paul's talking about and to find out, understand the hope and understand how you keep Christ as, you, as your head. Um it's an interesting thing to me too that he says the word of the truth of the gospel if well and in second Corinthians we talk about the word of reconciliation the same difference isn't it? well it is I just I, I just find the phrasing interesting to me it's like the, the verse you know rightly dividing the word of truth it is. I'm, I don't dispute that it's the word of truth. But he, we also often talk about this book as the word of God. And that's true too. 
Paul could have used any term he wanted. I understand that it was the Holy Spirit, but Paul, the Holy Spirit and Paul could have used any term they wanted to describe rightly dividing the word of truth, the word of God or whatever. And here where he throws in this issue of, well, you heard the word of the truth of the gospel. Why didn't he just say you heard the gospel? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And it, and it got to me to thinking, well, does that mean that there's a lie of the gospel? And if there's a lie of the gospel, it clearly wouldn't be true. It'd be a fake gospel. Okay, now back when in, in, in mm -hmm. uh, Galatians, where he said, I marvel that you so soon removed from the called you to the gospel. You know the gospel. Right. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And that, that's, that's what I want to look at. Okay. And the, it's never called the lie of the gospel, but there is the truth of the gospel. But then there is this gospel that, that and, and let's remember, the word gospel is just, means good news and now Paul's not saying you know, I'm not you know, let me take Paul out of it I'm not saying that the lie of the gospel is a legitimate other gospel it's like when Paul says in Galatians if you follow another gospel which is not another gospel right he says you, they say it's a gospel but it's not it's not really good news it's, it's not really good it's news. True, it's not good news exactly what he'd be saying there probably is it's not any more no it's not for the day no it's, it used to be maybe I mean, back when they're trying to teach. Right. But, but not anymore. Right. The hope, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Now, how did they learn about that? Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? They didn't hear it in a different gospel. They heard it in the truth of the gospel. They heard it in Paul's gospel. Look over at, let's run, run a couple of verses. Look over at 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians four. Second Corinthians four and verse uh, verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the, man, the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. There, there, there's the focus of the gospel, Christ Jesus the Lord right there. Look over at 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Well, one of those means is denying a person's hope. And if you're going to have your hope denied, you're going to have to be in another gospel. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which we have not received, that would be a spirit of fear, by the way, or another gospel, that would be the gospel of the circumcision, which we have not, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You see, none of those things in verse 4 would promote Jesus as the head of the church and body of Christ, nor would they promote their hope. They would actually take away from that. Look at verse 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles. These are the people that are doing the things in verse 4. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who end, whose end shall be according to their works. You see, there, there's a false narrative out there, and it's, it's permeating. We talked about it before we got started here today. Look over at 1 Timothy. Now he's going to give you a very clear definition of what this is. Look at 
1 Timothy 1 and verse 4. 1 Timothy 1, actually verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That's, of course, Paul's doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, that's Israel's program, which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now the end of the commandment, what's the commandment? Teach no other doctrine. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling. He describes vain jangling in the next verse. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. These people are not preaching the word of the truth of the gospel. When they add the law to it, it's clearly biblical. But it's not dispensational. It's not the gospel for us today. It's a gospel that will stunt people's growth. Look, these people want to teach the law? Who are these people? Are they Jews or Gentiles or both? Both. That's what you got going all across the nation. That's, yeah, that's what's going on now. But there's a reason they teach it. Come with me to Second Timothy. Before we get too hard on the teachers of it, though we need to be hard on the teachers... There's a reason they do it. Verse uh, Second Timothy four and verse one. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto what? Fables. They teach fables, and they teach the law, because there's an audience. Okay. There's a group of people out there that, 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 that want it. I mean, think about this. Most of us in these rooms and, and, the, the, and on Facebook and, and what we call the Grace Community, we have done that. We have been in churches that didn't teach what we wanted to hear, right doctrine. So we left that church and went somewhere. These people, they're wanting... Now, Paul describes them here, and not in a very good way. Look what he says about them. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. Got the engineers, the teacher, or the student? The student. Okay, thank you. The student. And but it's after their own lust. Now there's two ways to look at that. Either they want somebody that will tell them how to fix their lust, give them a law program, that's not that's never gonna work, or to excuse their lust. Yeah, okay. Well you can you can tell I mean just one thing, you look look at the big mega churches and look how they conduct their services. And you go into your grace church, or you go into, I mean, it's just even, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's what the people they go with, the, the, the kind of music. Turn, just look at TV and some of the things on there. Yeah, the big, I mean, they got all the lights flashing and, they, and all the, I mean, you'd think it's in a nightclub, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You know, when and one of the things that gets me, and other people have a problem, if, if somebody wants to go out and do an, an Easter egg hunt and at Easter time. I could care less. I don't think they're out there worshiping the pagan god. I've I've done it when I have grandkids. I'm sure we'll go and do it. But one thing I do have a problem with, and a huge problem with, is when churches have Easter egg hunts. Yes. I I just I can't. It's 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 like having an evergreen Christmas tree inside of a church at Christmas time. I'm glad you see that. Glenn has always talked about both of those. Things. Yeah, and it just I just. And I, you know, while we we're trying to get the kids in, so we give them the gospel. You know, they're out, the, the kids aren't. I, but, but to your point, they're just trying to look like the world. And I, if we look like the world, whether our church or our life, we need to rethink some things. Not much of a light, is it? It's I mean, not much of a light. I may have told this before, but we had a ministry in Dallas, uh, West Virginia, in Dallas Pike, and Dorothy and I stopped by one Sunday around Easter to visit. Oh dear. And uh, so they, they, they had a pretty good sized room trucks, I'll be giving them for the chapel. 
But anyway, Virgil, the chap named Virgil, was taking around and showed me the different things, that big decorations on it. And here's the Easter eggs and the bunny, the little candy-like eggs. Yeah. And I says, well, how does this present the gospel? He said, well, we're not going to <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's just, look over at Galatians 1, and, you, you know, uh, and people, you know, have a, it was it was interesting when Bill and uh, the Walkers and us used to do Bible studies. It was very interesting because one day of the week we we're at my house, and one day of the week we we're at Bill's house, Bill and Deb's house. They didn't celebrate Christmas at all. We we fully did. I mean, we completely did, and we just found a way that that was okay, and and we respected each other when we were in each other's houses, and and but yeah, a lot of that stuff that happens in the church building really uh, really bothers me. Um, I don't think they care that it bothers me, so there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Galatians 1 and verse 6. Yeah, well. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him, Paul's talking about himself, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And again, I've said it many times, it doesn't mean let him go to hell, separate from him, is all that means. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men, or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, now there's a lot of verses to go look at the thing in Colossians about the, the word of the truth of the gospel. He's talking about his gospel. And, and anything that, that's not Paul's gospel you, is, is not to be called the word of the truth of the gospel. And, I, you know, one of the things we learn as we go through Colossians here is too, if, if Paul doesn't say it, it's not for us. Now, somebody else in the Bible might say it, and Paul might say it as well. I mean, you see a lot, a lot of that with some of the Peter. But if, if you're, if if Paul hasn't said that it applies to the church of the body of Christ, it doesn't apply to the church of the body of Christ. And we can get in some real trouble when we start claiming verses that aren't the verses we should be claiming. And, and we want to be careful. And and again, that's where the confusion on the rapture comes from so much. People claiming verses that they think are to them that are not to them. Okay, I think I beat that one to death. Um, well, let me look at a couple. Come with me to Romans. Come with me to Romans. This will set up the next thing we're going to look at. Romans 1 and verse 16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. That's what Paul preached. When Paul talks about his gospel, he's talking about the, the gospel of Christ, the glorious gospel of, of, of Christ, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, things, things like that, the gospel of the grace of God. If you go back to Romans 1.1, 1, 1, though, you see there's a different gospel there. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, it was many years ago, but we looked at this when we did our Roman study. But there, he, Paul says, he was separated under the gospel of God, and he defines that clearly as he, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And then, in 15 verses later, he says, okay, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it's the power of salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew and the Greek first. Well, the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ are not the same thing. The gospel of God is something that, that, that as, as he says, it was promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, it's easy to figure out what it is. Come with me to 1 Corinthians 2. First Corinthians 2, 9 is quoting Isaiah 64, 4.
1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There's the gospel of God. There are some things that people couldn't think of that he has prepared for those that love him. And like I said, Paul quotes this verse here, but this originally showed up in Isaiah 64. Now, what becomes different, though, is Paul adds verse 10 and goes on and says, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Now the unsearchable riches of Christ have now been revealed to us. And that's what Paul preaches. Okay, so the gospel of God is just the good news that God has prepared something for those that love him. In the Old Testament, it was one thing. In, in, in Paul's gospel, it's the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you can see that if you go back to Romans 1, when he talks about the gospel of God and what he was separated to. Romans 1, verse 1 again. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Remember in Galatians, he just said, if he pleased men, he wouldn't be. That's okay. Called to be an apostle, separate of the gospel of God, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You see the prophecy program there in verse 3 and the mystery program there in verse 4. You see the humanity of the Lord in verse 3 and his deity in verse 4. See, Paul preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what Paul preached when the gospel of God concerned his concerned God's son, Jesus Christ, which was made of the seed of David, right? He came in the seed of David, according to prophecy. That's who, that, that's who Paul's gospel is centered around, is talked about. But the focus of it is, now, see, it says, and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead yeah. well he was declared to be the son of God back in Matthew 3 when he got baptized right. voice from heaven says that's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased yeah. okay but here Paul is, is talking about something that happened because of the resurrection okay, okay. now look at verse 5 by whom the risen Lord Jesus Christ we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among who? All nations. All nations. For his name, among whom ye are also the called of Jesus Christ. Paul was separated to the gospel of God in that he was separated. He's got some information to share about what God had promised when the world began for those that love him. Now, it concerns not him in his earthly ministry, but what the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ then revealed. And because of that resurrection, the right. new program that that the Lord Jesus Christ was able to bring in, and that is salvation going to the Gentiles through the fall of Israel. Okay. And so it goes... You're not, yep. you're not staying at that second... First uh, Corinthians 4, 9? 2, 9. That, 2, 9. Uh, but that is not for us. It just said it's a different... I have not seen than what was referred to back in Isaiah. Exactly. God, back in Isaiah, God said it, and, and he didn't have the next verse. There were some things that Israel did not know. There were some things that God had to reveal slowly to Israel that Israel didn't didn't know. Right? Adam and Eve didn't understand a lot of the things that were going to happen. Right. Abraham didn't understand a lot of the things that were going to happen. Those things weren't revealed. The prophets, Peter talks about the prophets. They wrote what they they wrote it, and they would search their own writings diligently to see what it meant. Now, when Paul quotes that verse, he's saying, "But now that stuff has been revealed. There, there is, there are the unsearchable riches of Christ that have been revealed now." And this lines up with Ephesians one: the mystery of God's will has been revealed. There are not secret things of God that we should be out there trying to discover because God's revealed his will to us. And he's told us at least twice. Right there in 1 Corinthians 2.10, but also in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. So, I mean, from the very beginning of creation, God had things prepared for those that love him. Think about how differently it would have been for Adam and Eve 
if they hadn't sinned. Yes. Right? Well, now, what happens is, Paul. now through Paul, think about what he says in Timothy, consider what I say and God give you understanding in all things. Now, with, through Paul, all that stuff has been revealed. What is his plan for the Gentiles? What is his plan for the heavens? We're, we see also, there he's going to give us a little bit of a timeline, not for us, but for Israel. He's going to let us know when Israel's program starts back up again and what that's going to look like and how to prepare for them. So all anymore, if we want to know what... We can, in fact, know what God has prepared for us. It's not a walk of faith to say, well, I just can't understand it. Now, I mean, there are things we don't know when the rapture is going to happen. We're not talking about that. But, you know, to walk, I just don't know what God's will is. No, he, he has told you what he's got prepared for you if you love him. And And that's what's so important and so wonderful about the time that we live in is we don't have to go, huh, I wonder. It's written in a book. And that, that's what the rest of Second Corinthians 2 is, is about. We're not going to go through that tonight. But he's revealed them to us by his Spirit. Through the words on this page, he's revealed them to us. So when Paul's over here talking about the truth of the gospel, the word of the truth of the gospel, he's talking about this, the, his stuff. What, what, what the risen Lord Jesus Christ revealed to Paul and through Paul to the world. Which brings us to the next things in Colossians. And a lot of people will get, get real upset with this. So if you look back at Colossians... This is a very interesting thing. Yeah, Mikey Turbush on, on Facebook here says, Abs with Glenn, absolutely, the modern church is nothing less than a rock concert. I went to, when we left the, the, the Grace Church years and years ago, we went to our little local church and walked in, had a Tetris screen in the back. It was just, it was blew me away. I looked at my dad and I said, you think they'll take us back? <laughs> All right, so look at Colossians 1 and verse uh, verse 5 again, just to get the context. Did you say that was the church that you used to go to? Grace? No, that was not the Grace. That's where we went after we went. After we oh, left the Grace Church, I hadn't been in organized religion in 20 years. I mean, I'd been wandering in the wilderness, and I went, so how bad, how bad could it really be, right? I mean, is it really as bad as they say? <laughs> Oh yeah, you know, it's bad news when the when the best thing you think about when you leave that church is the name of their coffee shop, which was Hebrews. <laughs> oh, and then they yeah. and, and then they taught Lord's Prayer as the way we should pray today, and oh, it was it was a nightmare. It really was a nightmare. Uh, verse five: For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you? Okay, the gospel's coming to them, and that's easy enough. As it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it, as it doth also in you, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. It's an interesting phrase which he says there. The truth of the gospel has come unto the Colossians as it is in all the world. It, you know, you got a interesting. What did he did it come to America? To, to, I mean, there wasn't America. Did it come to the continents that we now call North and South America? Did it come to the eastern edge of what is now China, eastern edge of what is now Russia? It's an interesting thing that that he says there. Look over at um, verse twenty three, and look what he says. If you continue in the faith, grounded faith, grounded and settled. Be not moved away from the hope of the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which is preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister. Those are big statements. Yeah, those are big statements. What's that? He didn't go everywhere. No, he didn't. Paul Paul clearly did not go anywhere. Um look over it again back in Romans fifteen. Paul's own testimony about this. Romans 15, 19, uh, 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Even 
he he stayed in 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 his area there. Look at Second Corinthians. Go back to Second Corinthians and look at verse ten, or chapter chapter ten. Verse 13, actually. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 13. Um, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But then they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You know, that, that's what the church falls trapped to, right? Comparing how, big, how, how many people do you have today? How many people do you have today? It's, it's not wise to do that. Verse 13. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Paul only went so far. There were some places Paul, the Holy Spirit told Paul, don't go. So, it's interesting when he talks about, 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 about the world there, and I just want to look at two definitions that the Bible uses for the world. Okay. And and then I'll give you my, my take on this. Look at Luke 2. Luke 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this tax was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Okay, so, I mean, clearly in the context, when they say the, the world there, he's not talking about what we call the Americas today, right? Or, or, or South Africa. He's talking about the Roman Empire. It's clear in the, in the context. Whoever Caesar Augustus had the power over, that's what he's calling the world there, right? Okay, look at Romans 3. Romans 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Well, not only is that clearly everybody on the planet, but everybody that's been. Yeah. Right? I mean, Caesar Augustus, he only ta the world in that context was only the people that were alive at that time. Caesar Augustus doesn't tax you. But this verse is talking about all the people that would come. So when he talks about this coming in, as coming into all the world, you really need to think about this issue. Well, you look at Romans. Go back to Romans ten. That talks about the people that are under the law here in that nineteen where you started. Back in right, that, and that, that's 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 the point of what he's saying there is. Look at the law is going to condemn everybody, so that everybody's condemned. Okay. The the whole world is is condemned because he's already made the point. What he's arguing here is, is the people that have the law, they're no more righteous than people without the law. The law condemns them, therefore, the whole world's condemned. They're guilty. The whole world may become guilty before God. Look at Romans 10. Oops, I'm in the wrong chapter. Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, speaking of Israel, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And, and I mean, that's that's good, right? How can somebody believe if they haven't heard, and how can they ha how can they have heard if there wasn't a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And, I mean, those are all legitimate questions. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and the words unto the ends of the world. Again, clearly, I mean, in the context, that's clearly talking about the, the planet and going everywhere. What, what you've got here is that you've got a dispensational setting. At the time of Abraham, the world was under the Abrahamic covenant. Now, whether or not somebody could could uh, bless Abraham there were I mean the vast majority of the world didn't even know Abraham existed 
Yeah. But that doesn't mean that wasn't the, 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 the economy that was going during that time was that law economy. So somebody's going to say, well, what about the people in South Africa? What about the people in the Americas at the time? You know, God expects them to walk in the light of which they had. All right? And it, it's interesting, most of those that hadn't heard Israel's law, they do have a creation story in there they do that they do acknowledge the existence of a creator okay now I, I'm I, I don't need to go down that path it's not my decision whether or not somebody was saved because they believed that there was a creation my point on that is that that's that's God's issue to deal with okay but what I'm saying is back then the economy the 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 the, the issue the way God was dealing with the world in that time was through the law so it was Israel's word, we just saw Israel's world that went throughout all the earth and throughout all the world. It was a law-based economy at that time. Okay? Now, what Paul's saying is that gospel, that the word of the truth of the gospel which came to you, Colossians, it's come to the whole world now. That is the economy the world is now under. Is a grace economy. God is not dealing with the world in two different... He's not dealing with, with back in time past... Israel one way and the rest of the rest of the world another way. Nor is he dealing with he wasn't dealing with if I can put it that way, Israel according to the law and the rest of the world according to grace. Now they didn't have Israel's law, but they still had to acknowledge the creator. Okay? They still had to walk in the whatever light that they had. Today the issue is grace. The issue is not um Working, toiling to make God happy with you. The issue is not putting yourself under a performance-based acceptance system. And that's true in the whole planet. Okay? Yeah, well, Dave, what about the people in the tribes in Africa? Yeah, that's God's responsibility to deal with that. Okay? Again, they're, they're responsible to walk in the light that they have. But it is interesting, too, to me, that he says it is come into all the world. So I want you just to see that that's a dispensational setting. There was one economy in the world and now today there's a grace economy in the world whatever went to the Colossians went to the whole world and that should give us great comfort to know that that's how God's dealing with all of mankind today and at the time of Colossi except for that little flock that had already got saved that's also one way you know Paul's gospel was going to everybody because it was in all the world not all the world except Judah it says all the world there um Paul's gospel is in the world. It is everywhere. The death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel of salvation and of hope today. First Timothy, right, tells us what? God will have all men to be saved. Not all men except in Canada. Not all men except in Israel. God will have all men saved today. That's what he's talking about when he says, the gospel that came to you it's come to the whole world. Today, the issue is not the gospel of circumcision, but the gospel of the uncircumcision. Not not the law-based economy, but the gospel of the grace of God. The, for, for everybody. Okay? Um, now, he says here also that you notice that, what does that gospel do? We often think about the gospel saves people. And does the gospel save yeah, we read the verse, right? It's the power of Christ and of God unto salvation. But look what he says here. Which is coming to you as it is in all the world, and what? Bringeth forth fruit in all the world, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. The gospel doesn't just save. It brings forth fruit. We need to remember that. The gospel is not something that we... <coughs> that we use to get saved and then just hang it up on the cross and move on about our business. It, grace stays with us. Grace is the motivating factor. Look over at James 1. We saw earlier that people are, af after their own lust, looking for those teachers having itching ears. Look at verse James 1, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he, any, tempteth he any man. 
but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Lust brings forth death. Lust, sin, death. Completely opposite of the gospel. Think about this. I mean, this is kind of helps you figure out why he says in Galatians that the flesh and the spirit are against each other and they lust against each other, so you cannot do the things that you would. L your own lust brings forth sin and that brings forth death. The gospel brings forth fruit and positive fruit. Um, look over at Romans 6. Romans 6 and verse 17. Romans 6 verse 16. You know, it's amazing. I always write down a verse and I'm one shy of the verse I actually want. Romans 6 verse 16. He says, Know you not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even now, so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. See, our lust and our flesh just results in death. The gospel, though, it will bring forth fruit. The fruit of the, whole, fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of, 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 um, of being able to live a life pleasing unto God the Colossians knew the grace of God in truth they believed it and it was working in them um, if you go back and look at Colossians again it, it just what we saw earlier right over in Romans 10 faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God Thessalonians 2.13 right, tells us the word of God works effectually in you that believe it Paul in Ephesians 3 says that you can understand the mystery when you read it they believed it they heard the gospel they heard the word of God they knew it to be the truth and not only that but they believed it and because of that it worked fruit and you can see the fruit they had faith in Christ Jesus and the fruits of the love which they had to all the saints. And it left an impression. So, we'll move into verse 7 now. But I, I told you on Tuesday I was going to tell you I would, had been wrong about something. And I don't, I'm don't. i wrong a lot. I just don't admit it very much. <laughs> so, um, you go into verse 7. He says, Speak and knew the grace of God and truth as he also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto your, us your love in the Spirit. So we said the other day, and I stand by this, that Paul apparently didn't know the Colossians by face. It, it doesn't appear that he was the one that, that, that brought the gospel personally to, to them. Um, but it, it wasn't Epaphras either. Because Epaphras, you see, and he, as he also learned, they'd heard the grace of God, but then Epaphras... He also taught them. And then when, when Epaphras came to Paul, he also declared. So somebody else had... Uh, Paul had heard about the Colossians. And then when Epaphras came, he just gave testimony of that witness, if you will. Okay? And also, Colossians had heard the great, great gospel of the grace of God. And Epaphras, he was there, and he was teaching it as well. So I was looking, thinking about this guy, Epaphras. And so I started looking for him. And he only shows up twice. Here and in the book of Philemon. Um, 
And I, I came across something that bugged me. It really bugged me. And so look, come with me if you would. Keep a hand here, a marker here, and also come to Philemon. And this maybe doesn't matter to people, but I said one thing, I think I was wrong, and I want to correct it. I know I was wrong, and I want to correct it. And what I said was, Colossians and Philemon were probably written and delivered at the same time. That's not the case. So if you look at Philemon 23, he says, There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner of Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So I'm just going to write this on the board. So you see there we have Epaphras in, in Philemon. We have Epaphras. <clears throat> Who else do we have there? Epaphras, Marcus, which is Mark. What's the next one? Aristarchus. Aristarchus. The next one? Demas. Demas. Lucas. And Lucas. So now, look what he says to, to Paul, or to Philemon in verse 23. There, wherever, wherever Philemon is, he says there, salute these five guys. Salute Epaphras, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, and Lucas. Okay? If Philemon's going to salute them, they got to be with Philemon. But he calls him his, my fellow prisoner. Right. Right. It's a good point. So we don't. Okay. But, but he can't salute them if they're not there. Right. Okay? Right. Okay, now go ahead and go back to Colossians. In the end of the book, Colossians 4. Okay, and so when we come to verse 12, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. So there's Epaphras. We'll just put the verse number. He's in 12. Look at, look at verse 10. There's Marcus. <clears throat> Aristarchus is in verse 10 as well. Yeah. Okay. And look what he says too about those guys. Um, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister, son, to Barnabas. And then look at verse 14. You have Luke and Demas. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Oh. Okay. So these same five people are with Paul when he writes the book of Colossians. Well. And like you said, the one was the fellow prisoner. So yeah. apparently he got out and went back. Now it's possible, it doesn't make any sense, that these five people took the book of Colossians back along with Tychicus and Onesimus. That doesn't seem to make much sense because he wouldn't need to tell him to salute him. Oh, yeah. Right? He, these people are with Paul. Or when Paul writes to Philemon, he says, hey, tell him hi for me. Okay. When Paul writes Colossians, these same five people, he says, Philemon, these people, or, uh, not Philemon, he tells the, the assembly in Colossians that these five people say hello. So he wouldn't need to say that if they were going to be there when they delivered the letter. So there's a different time here. So, so Philemon is a church at Colossae? Philemon's a person. I know he's a person. Right, and Philemon lived in Colossae or thereabouts. Colossae. And, thereab and they're thereabouts. All right. Okay. So my point was, well, wait a second. If they were with Paul when he wrote Colossians, they couldn't have been with, and and they were with Philemon when Paul wrote Philemon. They both they both the books couldn't have been written at the same time. But he is a prisoner in all of them, and now we're going to throw the book of Philemon in the mix too. And you're going to see there's a progression here, which I think is kind of neat. So look at Colossians four. 
and verse uh, in fact if you look at verse 10 regarding Marcus he says touching whom ye receive commandments if he come unto you receive him so clearly he, when Paul writes Colossians he, he's not there yet um Hmm, that's not what I want. Anyhow, in Colossians, there's no evidence that Paul knows if he's getting out or not. All he does is look at, like verse, uh, with Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner. Yeah, the, 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 he, who was the fellow prisoner. When you read this, there, there's no indication that Paul has any idea that he's going to be getting out of jail. No. He says he's sending people and people are coming to nourish him, but he doesn't there's no indication. If you come to Philippians one though and verse twenty three Philippians one verse twenty three for I am in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. You know, he's ready to go to heaven, but he says, well, to stay with you guys, it's better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So when, when he writes Philippians, he now appears that he thinks he's going to get out of jail. Yeah. Right? right. He, 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 there's no idea of, of, of the timeline, but it does appear that he's, he, he understands, well, I'm not going to die in prison. I said, I'm ready to go, but it's more needful for me to stay. Okay? And then go back to Philemon. Verse twenty two. But with but withal prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. So it appears now that he, he's expecting that his release is probably imminent. Yeah. So you can see Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, I still th believe they were all written at the same um, imprisonment. But there seems to be some time going by when each one's written. Because, his expectation. because of his, his expectation and where some of the other people are. Okay. Okay. And again, does it matter? Well, God put these little clues in here so that we could figure, figure it out and look at it. But I, I do think it's important in the aspect of you also can see Paul learning and understanding if you understand where his books, where his, where his books are, uh, laid out chronologically because they're not in the canon chronologically by any means mm -hmm. they're they're not backwards but they're mixed up <laughs> from from the one when he did it chronologically you say it doesn't matter but really it does because it breaks down more he's a human being and the, the, the life it's a lifestyle and the things like what goes on with us i mean from day to day he had something going on day to day i mean just it's too easy to read. It's like a supernatural person and, and spiritual. Right. I don't know how to say it necessarily, but and he's a man just like we are. Sure. And, and think about it, he, the relationships he had. And think about, you know, when you think too about some of those things in the book of Colossians, he's writing about not losing their hope. And he does, in the book of Colossians, there's no evidence that he knows when he's going to get out. But Philemon, Philemon is a book where you can clearly see his hope. It's interesting how you can take, like you said, his thinking as a man. Now, that's not about his hope there is to get out of jail, not to go to heaven. But you can see how that that hope works and could lift a person's spirit. Because you're right. We, we need to not think Paul was supernatural. God is supernatural, and God did some super. almost acted that way. Yeah, and, and God, God did some supernatural things with him. Yeah. But Paul was a man of like passions as we are. And he learned things, and he came to understand things 
And but there were people around him that did that as well. You know, the the other thing for me when I do that, that helps also me figure out some of the what was going on with Onesimus, Philemon's slave. Um, so, but again, you know, I I was looking at that and I go, man, you know, I've always thought Colossians and Philemon were written at the same time and that they were delivered by Onesimus to Philemon, but that that can't be the case. That, that just can't be the case. Um, oh, and the other thing I say, Paul had relationships. That's the other thing I see. Paul had relationships. Now, some of those people, uh, Demas left him. I know. Yeah, Demas left him, loving the pleasures of this world, and he went to Thessalonica. What was the issue at Thessalonica? The resurrection had passed. And he loved the pleasures of this world more, and he went to Thessalonica. So you start kind of thinking about some of those things. Wow. And then there's another whole study about, well, what does Demas have to, and the loving the world have to do with the teaching that the resurrection's passed and just work that out. <laughs> yeah, there's something for you to study. <laughs> so, anyhow, we'll 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 stop there and, and then we'll start picking up and going a little quicker now. Um, but some of those things and the the thing about the world, just understand that's a dispensational verse right there. It's the gospel of the grace of God that's in the earth today, in the world today, and it has been since Acts nine, and that's what Paul's been preaching. And when we get to verse 23, it's in every creature under under heaven. Well, you know, there are lots of creatures, if you want to say hum, you know, humans and all the animals and all the fishes, but there's also two creatures. There's the old, the old creature, and there's the new creature. There's um, the Israel, and there's the Gentiles. So... The, go the gospel doesn't change when it goes to different people. The gospel is the gospel. And the gospel is Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose again the next, the third day for your justification. And then along with that, the gospel of the grace of God will now want to teach us how to live a life pleasing unto God and how to keep him as a head, which is what we're learning in Colossians. You know, when we, we talked about a little bit, Paul he was these man's like we we are, and it's important to realize that because it it is easy to get our mind fixed on the idea that it basically is easier for him. It's like supernatural. He's like and when you realize that he got tired, he get, he had the same kind of things up against him as what we have today, and yet his commitment, meaning that we could be a whole lot more than what we are. Absolutely. Uh, Paul gave up everything. Yeah. And he's a pattern, just like he tells was it Titus or it Timothy, to Timothy be a pattern yeah. of you know for people to follow him. Oh right. And so we should be we should follow him the same way. He was beat thirty nine times, multiple times. I get a hang nail and I cry like a little baby. And my wife goes, Ugh. But and we forget to get beat thirty nine times. That was a big strong Roman big boy not only did it hurt but it took time I mean how long do you think it took to get lashed 39 times I'm sure it wasn't a minute well if you just got 10 lashes even 5 that'd be unbearable yeah yeah and and you know I, you guys have heard I, I've told it before you know I've gone down to Lake Shasta and I've hung out with my adult beverage floating on a a life jacket, just real relaxed, and, and you know, in, in eighty degree weather, eighty degree water, and after about an hour and a half, I'm I'm done. That's good. Yeah. Paul was in the dark a day and a half, yeah. and that was not Shasta. That was yeah. the sea, yeah. you know. And we we sometimes forget what he went through, but then we also forget. Get and I find great uh, comfort in in seeing his his failures. Romans seven for me gives me great comfort. Because when I do it, I can look to Paul as an example of that, okay, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And I know the answer. What did Paul think the answer was? When I'm whining and complaining like I have been the last two or three days, I can go to Corinthians and say, what would Paul do when he whined and complained? Well, he finally learned that God's grace was sufficient for him. But he whined and complained. That's what he was doing. Yeah. Take this thing away. And it gives me comfort to know that he was a man. And he learned these things. Now, 
you want to be careful too. You don't use that as a procrastinate, as a right. issue to procrastinate. To, well, I'll keep learning then. <laughs> At some point, you need to know it. <laughs> Those that keep having to learn the same lessons over exactly, exactly. That is, is, isn't, isn't that the shame of it? So, all right. Dear Heavenly Father, we, again, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. We do thank you that is the gospel of grace of God, Paul's gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is in all the world today. Um, that all men, that you would have all men to be saved, that all men can approach you. Just believe that your son died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. You promise to save any anybody that believes that, regardless of anything that they have done, who they are, how they, you know, any characteristic they want to define themselves by, you'll, you'll accept them if they'll simply believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of your son. Will you thank you for your grace in that wonderful amount of love that we actually can't really comprehend? Um, and we do thank you again for your love and for your grace. In your name, amen. Amen. And thanks, Dave. Yeah, nice yeah, you bet. Thanks, for, thanks everybody, for being here. So we will uh, be there on Sunday. And I am not going to, I'm going to, you guys are going to have to see me stay right behind that pulpit because April's not there to move the camera. So <laughs> see if I can get one of my kids to move the camera. Otherwise, I'm going to be in cement shoes and. It's funny. I used I used to not move at all. I'd get up there and I'd grab that thing, and my knuckles would turn white, and I wouldn't move. And now I can't stand behind it. <laughs> so, anyhow, all right. Well, we're gonna say.